President Gregory Maine, Chancellor the Right Reverend Lawrence Abbott Lawrence, Dr. Richard McDowell, the Provost here, faculty, the board, students, alumni, family, friends, and you, the class of 2014, the graduates. Thank you for the honor. Thank you for the joy to be a part of this day, which is a celebration. And as I was reflecting on what I wanted to share with you, the beginning of the scriptures came to mind. And as I was thinking about the sixth day in which upon completing creation, our Lord looked down and saw that unlike the other days which were simply good, that day was very good. I thought about how our Heavenly Father is looking on all of us today and how he created the human mind with intelligence and how this day which celebrates your academic achievements and how he also created us for relationship encounter with another human who is unrepeatable and irreplaceable and how on this day those people meaningful to you are gathered how our Lord is looking upon this moment and thinking this is very good when I was very little not too little but little enough to read childlike novels there was a type of book I loved to read. And it was called Choose Your Own Adventure. I don't even know if these books exist anymore, but what would happen is you would read about one third of the book, and then when you got to the end of a chapter about a third of the way in, it would say turn to page 90, or turn to page 130, and whichever page you turned to, it would radically change the adventure you read about. And as I was reflecting on those novels, I was thinking about how our lives are very much like a choose-your-own-adventure novel. Every day we make choices and decisions which profoundly impact the adventure of our lives. What I wanted to do today was share with you what I believe are three principles that will ensure we wisely choose our own adventures to ensure that our lives are lives well lived. For you are at the close of one chapter and about to begin another. How do you begin with wisdom? How do you ensure it's a life well lived? I believe our lives will be well lived if they are lives focused on others. Our lives will be well lived if we believe in the power of perspective. And our lives will be well lived if we do the right thing, even when it's hard. And I believe those three principles are already principles you have been living by, which brought you to this moment. And the challenge is to just continue carrying them forward. The graduates, you are recipients of that first principle of focusing on others. For it is the loved ones that have gathered here today, your parents or grandparents, aunts and uncles, friends, who have been focused on you. And as a result of focusing on you, have contributed to this great moment. And the best way we can honor people who have put others first is to let their legacy live on by us putting others first. Because we know when someone lives a life not oriented to the self, but oriented to the other, that there's something attractive about that kind of life. And when someone lives not for the other, but for themselves, there's something repulsive about that. That can be seen in what I like to call a tale of two captains. One month ago, a captain had to choose his own adventure. Five years ago, a different captain chose a different adventure. One of them focused on himself, but the other focused on those around him. One month ago, devastation struck South Korea when a ferry with hundreds of teenagers capsized. And that made international news not only because of the loss of life, 
but because the captain of that ferry abandoned the ship. And our world looked at what he did. And we knew in our hearts there was something wrong, and we knew it was wrong because he put himself first. But five years ago, a very different captain in a very different crisis made a very different choice. Five years ago, an airplane taking off in New York got struck by Canada. I have to actually apologize on behalf of my country. But you see, our Canadian geese decided to take the same flight path as this airplane. And so uh, my apologies. But as the captain of this airplane was taking his plane up into the sky, the Canadian geese decided to fly into the engines. And that captain realized he needed to make an emergency landing, and he had a choice to make. Crash his plane into the buildings of New York City? or do his best to land his plane as safely as possible on the Hudson River. And so he chose the latter adventure. And with the grace of God, with what became known as the miracle on the Hudson, that captain landed his plane, and when it came to a stop, everyone inside would have done what they were told to do at the beginning of the plane, in the event of a water landing. You know, I always tune out as a frequent flyer. I never pay attention for what you should do in the event of a water landing, because I always think, in the event of a water landing, I'm dead. And then the miracle happened, and I thought, I need to pay attention. So everyone, if they had tuned in, would have realized grab your life jacket and go to the nearest exit. The people at the back would have gone to the back, but they didn't know something very important. They did not know that the tail of the plane was submerged in the water. And when the first person to get to that emergency door whipped it open, water started flooding in. Now everyone at the back is getting away from the back of the plane, and they're exiting out the middle doors, and they're exiting out the front doors. And as everyone is escaping the back, one person Captain Chesley Sullenberger was walking towards it. And as water was filling the cabin, he walked the aisle twice to make sure no one was left on the plane. He was the last person to get off. Our world looked at what he did and instantly cried, Hero. Why? Because he put others for himself. And we know, looking at his example, that there is something true and something good and something beautiful about that for which we are to follow. But ultimately, whether it's the self-sacrifice of your loved ones or the self-sacrifice of Captain Sullenberger, these are mere reflections or mirrors of the ultimate sacrifice in which the other was put before the self. When our Lord gave his life, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. So moving forward, if we are to be focused on the other, part of focusing on the other is not only the other in front of us, but the other above us. Who are we living for? And what does he want us to do? One of my previous spiritual directors encouraged me to read a phenomenal book called The Soul of the Apostolate. And in this book, which talks about how we can live a life focused for others and become so busy that we don't take time to pray. But when we don't take time to pray, we become dangerous. Because while we think we're focusing on others, we're running on our own power. But if we take time to pray, then we're first focusing up, and then we focus out. And within this book, it makes a reference from St. Bernard, who said we are to be reservoirs and not channels. The body of water, a channel, the water just flows through it. That's the busy person who doesn't take time to focus on the other being God. We are not to be channels. We're to be reservoirs, and a reservoir fills up and the excess overflows. If you want to serve others well, take time in prayer under the inspiration of your creator. And once you have filled up, you have profound goodness 
to give to others. Besides living a life in which we focus on others, it's so important we live a life in which we understand the power of perspective. Several years ago, I traveled to Poland and I knew when I was in Poland I would be going to Auschwitz. And in preparation for the trip, I read a number of different books about the country, its history, and I read a book by an Auschwitz survivor called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. After surviving the war, Frankl practiced as a psychiatrist, and in his book he tells the story of how a man came to him who had struggled with depression for a decade. And this man came to Dr. Frankel, hoping to be healed. He said, Doctor, you must help me. My wife died 10 years ago, and I can't bear living. I am suffering so much in her absence. My life is miserable. I don't want to get out of bed in the morning. And Dr. Frankel looked at that man, and he said, Sir, what would have happened if you had died first? and your wife were still alive. And the man looked at him, he said, oh doctor, oh doctor, the wife I love so deeply would have suffered so profoundly. If she were the one alone, she'd be miserable. She'd experience so much pain. And so the doctor looked at him and he said, well sir, by you suffering, by you experiencing her absence, the woman you love will never experience the pain you would never want her to know. And like that, the man was cured of a decade-long depression. That is the power of perspective. Viktor Frankl says the last of the human freedoms that can never be taken from us is the freedom to choose how to respond to the situation that we're in. That man's circumstances didn't change, but his perspective did. Your graduates here today very much have had to live the importance of perspective because there have likely been times in the preceding years where you have faced challenges and difficulties and been tempted to give up, but you had a perspective that was not short-term and in the moment, but it's perspective that was long-term and into the future, which brought you to this moment today. May we never lose sight of the power of perspective. Several years ago, I had the privilege of spending an afternoon with a motivational speaker from Australia by the name of Nick Vujicic. Nick was born without arms and legs, and he travels the world speaking to millions of people, meeting with governments and royalty, he has one deformed foot that sticks out of his torso, and with that he plays soccer, and he golfs, and he surfed, and he's married, and they just had a baby. When Nick Vujicic was in elementary school, he was bullied and taunted and persecuted so much that in one moment of weakness, while lying in the family's bathtub, he thought about rolling over and drowning himself in an act of suicide. Why? Because of his perspective. He was focused on what he couldn't do and what he didn't have and how he thought his future looked grim. But one day, one day when Nick was reading the scriptures, he came across the ninth chapter of John, which says, and as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked Jesus, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned, nor his parents, but it was in order that the works of God may be displayed in him. This man was born blind so that the works of God may be displayed in him. And Nick read that and he thought, I don't have arms and legs so the work of God can be displayed in me. 
And he has done profound things with his life. And it's because his greatest obstacle became his greatest opportunity. Which areas in your own lives are your handicaps? Physically, maybe. But what about mentally, psychologically? Where are we weak? And rather than on focusing on what we can't do and don't have, should we instead focus on what through that weakness we can do so that the works of God can be revealed in us? Perspective. A life well lived. An adventure chosen wisely involves perspective and being focused on others. And finally, it involves doing the right thing even when it's hard. Again, an experience that you graduates are likely familiar with times where things got so difficult you wanted to give up, give in. And yet, you didn't. You've incurred debt. You've faced challenges. You've stretched your brains in ways you thought weren't possible. You've had to juggle commitments with family and school obligations, extra jobs, but you persisted. You did the hard thing. Don't leave that attitude here, but take it with you. Too often when we read the news, it's filled with negative, disturbing scandals involving corporations and involving politicians and sometimes even involving leaders of our churches. And we look at these scandals and we could ask ourselves why, and I'll tell you why those scandals happen, because the people amidst the scandal choose the easy way or what they thought was the easy way. But we are called not to the easy way, but the right way. And the right way is often the hard way. But we do it anyways. And so as you leave here and find yourself in new careers or further education, within families and new opportunities, always remember when those temptations come to act unethically. Perhaps cheat a little, lie a little, deceive a little. Those temptations come perhaps to be silent when we know we should speak. We should ask ourselves, what is the right thing? And the moment we identify the right thing, we say it doesn't matter if it's the hard thing. I am going to do it anyways. Authors Alex and Brett Harris have written a book titled, Do Hard Things. That should be our mantra going forward. Do hard things. If we think about so often we humans may find ourselves in a challenging situation, we confide with a loved one, we say everything that's the problem, and we summarize it with, I just don't know what to do. Might I suggest to you we often do know what to do. When we say we don't know what to do, we actually mean something else. What we're really saying is, this is the situation I'm in. This is the right thing to do. It's going to be really, really hard, and I don't like hard things, so I just don't know what to do. So if you find yourself saying you don't know what to do, ask yourself, do I know, but is it hard? And if it's hard, but it's right, then I will do it because it's right. Now Saint John Paul II, about 12 years ago, made a beautiful comment about doing hard things. He said to believe in Jesus today, to follow Jesus as Peter and Thomas and the first apostles and witnesses did, demands of it, demands of us, just as it did in the past, that we take a stand for him. At times, almost to the point of a new martyrdom, The martyrdom of those who today as yesterday are called to go against the tide in order to follow the divine master. That is doing the right thing even when it's hard. It's to go against the tide in order to follow the divine master. And as we move forward, and if we have that attitude of doing that right thing even when it's hard, of realizing that we can choose our perspective, 
and finally, of focusing more on others than ourselves, then I believe that through our lives we will be able to say, my life was a life well lived. My adventure was an adventure chose with wisdom. My life is a living out of the words of Mother Teresa, who once said, I am a little pencil in the hand of a writing God, sending a love letter to the world. Write well, write wisely. God bless you and congratulations.